Hello, and welcome to another episode of Disrupt Your Now, the show for entrepreneurs who are sicking tired of checking off the boxes. And tonight, I have an exciting guest, Oak McCullough, who is a retired Army officer, and he has done so many amazing things during the military, but also after, including disaster relief. And I'm not going to even get into all of it because I want you to talk about it, Oak. But he is the author of Your Leadership Legacy, Becoming the Leader You Were Meant to Be. And I'm really excited for y'all to hear him talk because one thing that I want you to come away with is that anybody can be a leader and it isn't just about managing people and managing business. So welcome to the show, Oak. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Lisa. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. So I want you to tell us how you got to where you are today. And you can yeah, start there, anywhere you want, as there, far back as you want. Yeah, there's a story for you. So <laughs> um, so I grew up in a small little farm town in northern Illinois um, mm -hmm. and went to a very small high school. I played baseball, basketball, football. I was the captain of my teams. Um, I was the student government president, uh, class president, whatever. So I had mm -hmm. some leadership positions in high school, and I, I liked it, and I wasn't too bad at it. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's maybe what I want to do. Uh, and then I went off to college, knew I wanted to, to be an officer in the army. So I went two years to the United States Military Academy at West Point, did not graduate from there, okay. came home, helped run my father's business for a little bit, and then fin finished up my last two years in Army ROTC, which is where I met my wife. She was in Army oh. ROTC as well. She was an army nurse for eight years. Oh, okay. So, so it worked out well for me, 37 years later, yeah. um, and got my commission as an infantry officer, did my first five years in the infantry, did my last 18 years as an armored cavalry officer, uh, retired from the army as a lieutenant colonel in 2009, mm -hmm. Was the, ran the day-to-day -day operations of one, a large food bank that covered 52 counties in three states along and the that, that was after the military ran it was the after food the bank? military. Okay. Um, so it covered all the coast of Mississippi, all the coast of Alabama, and about a third of the way into the panhandle of Florida. Wow. And I took over that job about a month, maybe a month and a half before the BP oil spill. So oh, I was a little busy during that time. And mm -hmm. then they offered me to come here to uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. It's tough to live here, but somebody has to. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we used um, to live here yeah, there. <laughs> to do recruiting for Army ROTC as a government service officer. So I did that for the last 12 years. And I just retired from that job one October. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just out on the speaking circuit talking to as many people as I can about what, what makes a good leader. I love the title of your book. Your leadership legacy, becoming the leader you were meant to be, to be, and part of the reason that I love it is because I feel like most of us never really understand ourselves, and that we never live up to what we could be. And I'm not talking about money or yeah. anything like that. It might that might be part of it, but I'm talking about what we bring to the world, our unique gifts. So I specifically love the title to your book. Because I think it'll get people thinking about that this is something that they can give to the world and will have lasting impact. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, legacy means something to me or I wouldn't have titled my book that. Mm -hmm. And uh, people ask me, so what does legacy mean to you? And I always say to me, legacy has two parts. Very small part of it is what you actually accomplish. Mm -hmm. that, that does matter. In the real world, results matter, you know, in fantasy land where everybody gets a trophy and everybody's a winner, or maybe <laughs> not. But in the real world where we live, <laughs> results do matter. So a small part of your legacy is what you did. And here's the problem. If you tie all of your legacy to what you did in an organization, when you leave and the next person comes in and they change everything, wh where's your legacy? Right. There is no legacy. Yeah. yeah. So. To me, the largest part of your legacy is that next generation of leaders that mm -hmm. you help produce. You know, and I've been lucky in my my career. The last 15 years of my time working with the Army, either on active duty or as a government service officer, mm -hmm. I've had my hand in helping to commission over 580 lieutenants for the United States Army and for this country. Wow. And to me, that's what your legacy is. Because mm -hmm. even after you leave, 
then they're going to teach the next generation who's then going to teach the next generation. Mm -hmm. And your legacy continues on by what you passed on to that group that you taught. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And the, just the fact that we can impact so many people, that generational ripple effect right. through, through actions more so than words. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I was lucky as a kid, you know, my father, who was a mean man, <laughs> but I am who I am today because of that. There's no doubt about it. I, I give him credit for a, a lot of making me who I am today. Uh -huh. He and my mom, but certainly him. Um, he always used to tell me, son, if you say one thing and you do another, it is your actions that will be believed, not your words. Uh -huh. And I live by that. You know, uh -huh. I, I believe that a leader has to set the example with integrity, your character, what you do on a daily basis, how you mm -hmm. act, how you interact with people. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the examples I use is if, if you're walking down the hall, if you're the leader and you're walking down the hallway and there's a piece of trash on the floor mm -hmm. and you don't bend down and pick it up and put it in the trash can, then how do you expect the people that work for you to do that? Right. You can't expect them to do things that you aren't willing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other piece of that, which I think we have forgotten, in this country, unfortunately, is that you really are as the leader, you are that moral, ethical, and lawful compass of your organization. Mm -hmm. They will do what you let them do. If you hold them to a standard and you make them do good things, they will do that. Mm -hmm. If you let them do bad things, they will do that. That's human nature. For sure. <laughs> so you as the leader have to have that moral compass and do the right thing because mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. Not because anybody's checking up on you or watching you. They, they are going to check up on you and they are watching you. But mm -hmm. that's not why you do it. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You know, I had this com similar conversation with my sister the other day because the university that we went to, we live by an honor code. And that was it. You know, the teachers weren't hovering, the professors weren't hovering over you and stuff. It was up to each person to live the way yeah. they were supposed to live. And if you some, saw somebody not doing what they were supposed to do or doing something they weren't supposed to do, it was your duty to tell. And so, you know, that teaches you so much as far as self responsibility and everything. And I'm like, I told her, I'm like, I'm really curious whether that university even still has that now, because I feel like, and not to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, because I'm not like, oh, all the young people are, you know, suck or whatever. But I really am curious to see if it's still working like yeah. it used to work. Yeah, my guess is it probably isn't. Um, yeah. But but it might be. I mean, you know, they may, that may be one of the exceptions rather than the mm -hmm. rule. For, but for the most part, universities have done away with stuff like that. Yeah, you know, he, you know, you bring up a good point, and I always like to emphasize this because I think another problem is that we, we as a society, and certainly in business and leadership, we use three words and we think they're interchangeable, and they're not. Mm -hmm. They are three distinct words that have completely different connotations and meanings, and um, and we got to get back to doing it. Number one is accountability. Mm -hmm. Everybody is accountable for what they do. Actions, performance, all of that. We should hold everybody accountable mm -hmm. for their performance and their actions. Authority, which is something that a leader has and can give away mm -hmm. to people in order that so they can accomplish the task, the mission, the job, the program, project, whatever you've assigned them. You give mm -hmm. them the authority to be able to do that. And then responsibility and responsibility is the leaders alone. You cannot delegate responsibility, yeah. nor can you say, that's not my fault. Sorry, leaders mm -hmm. don't get to pick and choose what it is they want to take responsibility for. You are responsible for everything that does or does not happen in your organization. Mm -hmm. And we got to get back to leaders understanding that yeah. instead of blaming somebody else or just saying, that's not my fault. But sorry, it is. Even if you didn't do whatever it was that caused you your organization not to be successful, it's mm -hmm. still your responsibility. You're the leader. Yeah, the buck stops here, right? Absolutely. You know, <laughs> Harry S. Truman. Yeah. Here. And then by 
trying to blame other people or weasel out of it, you once again are not being a leader. You're leading by a really poor example and you're teaching other people not to, they're, you're teaching them to shark their leader, their own responsibility. Oh, absolutely. And, and you destroy all the trust in your organization yeah. when you do that. You know, you want to build trust in an organization when you, this is how I always approached every job I ever had as a leader. If my organization did what it was supposed to do, if we accomplished what we were supposed to do, I went to my boss in front of my people and I said, hey boss, look what my guys and gals did. And oh, by the way, Lisa and Tom and Joe did a great job today. Mm -hmm. If we didn't accomplish what we were supposed to do, I went to my boss in front of my people and I said, hey boss, I messed up. Yeah. And this is how we're gonna fix it. Yeah. Because it's on me. Yeah. Because, yeah, no, I get it. You know, the other yeah, night. That doesn't mean I'm not going to hold people accountable. Oh, it's, yeah. No, yeah. You do. That's, a, again, we ought to hold everybody accountable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But in the end, I'm the one that's responsible. I'm the leader. And you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned acknowledging when people do good a good job and doing what they're they're supposed to do or going above and beyond and the other night my husband and i were going through some of his old stuff that we found up in the attic and ran across a letter from when he was in vietnam wow. from one of his i can't remember what rank it was this was when he was enlisted he did 13 enlisted 13 commission um he was enlisted i can't remember but anyway it was a letter commending him because something had happened that wasn't like part of his job or whatever. But he had seen something going wrong or whatever, and he had gotten another guy and they had gone and taken the initiative and taken up. care of whatever it was. And then came up with a plan for it not to happen again. And I just thought it was so cool. You know, whoever that person is now they have probably never thought about it again but reading it you might be surprised yeah you know so this would have been in the well i guess he went over at like 65 or so he's over there twice i don't remember which year it was um but it just it was so cool because for me as his wife to read it after i mean we've been together since 86 and i've never seen that letter somehow it, it appeared out of our attic yeah. you know but him at 77 to run across this letter that was probably written when he was like 20 or 21 and bring back memories. Oh, I'm sure it did. I have no doubt it did. And, yeah. and good memories at that, even though what he was doing wasn't probably good memory. But the, yeah. the, the, he was he was identified as somebody who stepped up and took took charge when it needed yeah. to be. You know, and that, that's that's why it is so important that every organization have has a professional development and a leadership development program. Mm -hmm. Even for people that you th don't think will ever be a leader in your organization, it's still important to train them in leadership because you never know when that person is going to need to step up and do. And even if they never do, anything that you anything that you do to make the people in your organi organization better mm -hmm. is only going to make it makes them better, which yeah. which is the main mission of a leader. Um, that and accomplishing the, the job, the task, uh -huh. getting the goals. But you make them better, which then makes your organization better, which then allows you to accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people who are not affiliated with the military don't have anybody close to them who are in it. A lot of them probably feel like before I met Tom, like I probably did, that when you're in the military, that leadership is all about I, sir, and just doing what you're yeah. supposed to do. And so there's two things wrong with that, that, first of all, they don't understand and aren't giving credit to the amount of self um, motivation that it takes to be able to do everything in the military. But also when people transition out, business owners and managers don't know how to work with those military, with the service members, because they don't understand. Yeah. What they bring to the that? table. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So, so I, I mean, believe me, there are plenty of leaders in the army that are the authoritarian micromanaging, do it exactly yeah. as I tell you to do it. There are plenty of those in the army. Yeah. Unfortunately, because they're horrible and nobody likes to work for them. I've worked for them and hated yeah. it. And, and what, what the problem is when you do that, you, you stifle all creativity. 
-hmm. Why would I stick my neck out when all I got to do is wait for you to tell me what to do? Yeah. So you get no creativity whatsoever. And on the other end of the scale, you have Attila the Hun and chaos, controlled chaos, but chaos. <laughs> and you want to be as far down that scale toward chaos as you can get. Uh -huh. and, this is, and this is how you get there. You train people to a standard and you hold them to that standard. So you know they can do what you're asking them to do. Yeah. You give them the resources that they need. You, you, <clears throat> you give them the big picture of what you want it to look like at the end. Uh -huh. You give them the resources that they need, time, money, people, equipment, whatever. You give them the authority to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Again, that's what leaders give. They give authority and resources. And then you get out of their way and let them do it. Will they do it exactly the same way you would have done it? Absolutely not. But who cares? Right. The analogy I always use is seven plus two is nine. But so mm -hmm. is eight plus one uh -huh. and five plus four and six plus three. And the way they do it might be better. And even exactly. if it isn't. How do you care why, how they get to nine? You just want them to get to nine. Give you what yeah. you want. Even if, if you do that, you're using their skills, their abilities, uh -huh. their knowledge, and you will get creativity. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you said, big picture, to me, that is so important. When people don't understand the big picture of why they're doing what they're doing and how it fits into the overall mission and not just military, but yeah. the big picture is what makes everything worthwhile. I remember one of my first jobs out of college, I, I had a degree in accounting and it was for a huge international conglomerate in the textile industry. And I was so bored. I was so miserable because all I could see was my little pieces of right. the numbers. I couldn't see anything out of my little piece of pie. And I'm like, who cares? Yeah, I'm really good at numbers, but I don't give a hoot about this. And then I was in the controller training program. So you go, you know, through different areas. So then I went into one of the plants and it was the combing plant where they bring wool directly off the backs of the sheep from New Zealand and all over the world. This gross, nasty wool comes rolling in right off their backs and it's got to be washed and combed and all that stuff. And it, oh, you can imagine what it smells like. I loved it there though, because all of a sudden that business felt real. It wasn't just a bunch of numbers. Yeah. You knew why, you know, yeah. and I always tell business owners and CEOs and presidents and anybody who I talk to, I said, look, you, you got to have the big vision plan and that keeps it, that way, even no matter what my part of it is, I know what in the end. So if something's going off the rails and I can step in and help put it back on track, then, yeah. then we can do that. I said, but not only do they, everybody does everybody in your organization need to know the big picture, they need to know their specific part of what they've got to do to help that organization get there. Because if they don't know their specific part, how can they help you? Exactly. And... First, they got to know where they're going to get there. But then if they don't understand the part that they are playing in it, then right. if they go off the rails, it's like if you're taking a cross country trip in your own multiple vehicles, well, you might get separated, but everybody can figure out their own way and catch back up with each other. If, if, not if, if they, they don't know where they're fly. going, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, it, it, it just amazes me how, how, leaders don't understand that, that look, their job, their big job is the vision and the plan, but they got to disseminate that to the people. Because yeah. if you think as the leader, you're the one that's going to get you to that big plan, mm -hmm. that vision, you're sadly mistaken. It's the people mm -hmm. that work for you that are going to get you there. And if they don't understand what it is, then they can't, they can't do their part to get you there. Yeah, for sure. Can you tell, share with us maybe some of the stories your experiences from the past your the past some of your favorite leadership examples that people could live by yeah or could learn by yeah absolutely so I, I i'm i i use this term and i'm sure somebody used it before me and i picked it up somewhere the enemy has a say okay uh -huh. yeah. you, you can come up with the best plan and everything else and no matter what happens <laughs> the enemy whether that's a bad guy in the army or whether it's your competitor in the business world, or it can be the weather, it could be whatever, doesn't matter. Yep. It can be anything that interferes with your plan. They, it has a say. So you've always got to have a plan B, C, D, whatever. Well, I was a brand, I was a, I'd been a Lieutenant for probably about three years, two years. And 
we were stationed at Fort Stewart, Georgia in the 24th Infantry Division and Hurricane um, Hugo was coming. Oh, yeah. Us. And Hurricane Hugo was supposed to go right into Savannah Harbor. Uh -huh. But it didn't. It all of a sudden at the very end, it pushed north and it went into Charleston. Yep. And so we got activated to go up to Charleston and help with the disaster relief in Charleston. And here I am. I'm an infantry lieutenant training to fight and win wars. And they they pull me and my platoon, my 32 guys, and we stop at this warehouse. And they said, here you go, Lieutenant. This is your warehouse. You're going to run it until we're done. I said, I said, I'm an infantry officer. I don't know anything about running a warehouse. And they said, <laughs> figure it out, Lieutenant. So, you know, even you, you just got to be flexible. You got to decide that no matter what you get handed, you got to make it work. Yeah. You know, I was lucky as a, as a lieutenant. I got to listen to a speech given by General Hal Moore. Oh, and wow. They, and, they just, and they just named, renamed Fort Benning after him. Uh huh. Or, I mean, he was probably one of the greatest combat generals our country's ever produced. And I heard him talk one time and he used this analogy. He said, life and leadership, he said leadership, but even life is not like baseball. It isn't three strikes and you're out. When you're in a situation and you don't know what's going on, you try something. And if that doesn't work, you try something else. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, you try something else. And you keep trying until you figure it out. You don't just throw your hands up and say, yeah, I don't know. It, I love leaders, that. Leaders don't, leaders don't have that option. Right. Figure it out. Keep going. Keep trying things. Yeah. Pivot. Yeah. Adapt and overcome, right? That's right. Yeah. You, you, you right. Have to, it's like I was telling you about my father being blind. Anything he wanted to do, he figured out how he was going to do it. Yeah. And I, now I call him the human Roomba. <laughs> of course, we didn't have Roombas back then. It's like he'd bump into something back up. But, yeah. but same type of thing that that you make up your mind that you're going to do something and you do it, whether it's something that you just want or whether it's something that, that you have to do. Is, and Hurricane Hugo, I believe... We were living in Jacksonville, and I think that's the hurricane. That was one hurricane that we evacuated for because it was supposed to hit the hit the St. John's mouth of the St. John's at high tide. Yeah, and it was barreling right at us, and so we left. And then it did; it made that turn north. Yeah, and and we ended up, you know, nothing happened really in Jacksonville. And my cousin lived in Charlotte, and they lost power for a week. Oh, I, I can tell you. It's, uh... Charleston was underwater. I mean, yeah. nine, 10 feet of water. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was, it was, the, you know, I, again, growing up in the Midwest, I had no idea what hurricanes were about. Uh -huh. I, I could talk about tornadoes all you wanted. Oh, um, yeah. Saw plenty of those, but uh, hurricanes, that was my first experience with a hurricane. And, you know, and it, it, it was devastating. I mean, I, I was yeah. shocked at the amount of damage that those things do. And now yeah, it, in Florida and I see it quite often, but. Yeah, and then after Hurricane Andrew, even though we weren't in it, because because obviously it was in South Florida. Yeah, but I went down we went there. Down to the Keys for years, you know, all the trees were twisted off, so there was always that visual reminder. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they I, I, they still haven't. They never did build. Yeah. Back the way it was, yeah. um, they they built some of it back, but not not the way it was before the hurricane. And that's um, also where some of the pythons came from. Probably. Yeah, because of like pet shops and stuff yeah. like that. I've gotten way off topic, but no, that's all right. um, it's so, t okay, tell us another good story. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, so I was a, an operations officer. Here's another one where you, you just figure it out. Uh -huh. I was an operations officer. So I, I was in charge of running the day to day operations of our armor battalion. And we were in uh -huh. Kosovo in 2000. And uh, the Russian sector butted right up against ours. Um, so the Russians had a, a force there that ran their sector and we ran our sector. Mm -hmm. We had a bunch of international soldiers in our sector as well, but mainly American soldiers. Well, we ran an Albanian checkpoint at this at one point and three miles away, it was like no man's land. There was nothing in between us and that oh. Russian checkpoint. And the Russian checkpoint was in Serb territory, and we were in Albanian territory. So the Russians 
were there for the Serbs. They they couldn't stand the Albanians. Yeah. Uh, and when the Albanians would come through their checkpoint, they would beat them up and they would steal, rob them and everything else. Mm -hmm. And they'd come to our checkpoint complaining. And, you know, and we this went on for a while. And then one day I was out doing something, whatever I had to do. And I get a phone, I get a radio call from my scout platoon leader who was at that checkpoint. And he said, sir, you got to come to the checkpoint. I said, well, I'm busy right now. I'm right in the middle of something. I said, mm -hmm. can I wait? And he said, no, I can't. I said, okay. So I dropped what I was doing and I went to meet my lieutenant and they had be beaten these three guys almost to death oh know, my like, gosh. and destroyed the car uh, just ripped not knocked all the windows had cut all the seats all into shreds wow I mean, was, so i said okay this is enough i said grab the platoon let's go over and pay a visit to the russians mm -hmm. so we did we drove the three miles over there and uh there was a lieutenant there, a Russian lieutenant that was in charge of that checkpoint, just like we had a lieutenant in charge of ours. Uh -huh. now, understand, I don't speak Russian. <laughs> he didn't speak English. I had an Albanian interpreter with me because I was oh. in an Albanian town right before that. Uh -huh. Luckily, he spoke Serb as well. Okay. The Russian had a Serb interpreter. Oh, my gosh. In English. So I, this, this picture of how this is going on. I would say something to the Albanian, my Albanian interpreter. He would translate it to Serb for the Serb interpreter who would then translate it to Russian. Oh my gosh. And then the Russian would say it in Russian. Uh -huh. The Serb would say it in Albanian. The Albanian would say it in English. So we're just going around circle. Wow. And I, I was telling him that that was unacceptable and that it had to stop and they had to stop beating up the people coming through their checkpoint. And so I told that to the Albanian and he said, you sh sure you want me to say that? I said, absolutely, word for word. And it went around. <laughs> I'm talking to my scout platoon leader while it's making its way around. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the Ru I hear the Russian say something in Russian. And the guy on the machine gun on the BMP right in front of me locks and loads his machine gun and points it at me. <laughs> I thought, Okay, well, you're going to die right here in Kosovo. <laughs> and so my guys reacted, you know, they're going to protect their majors. Yeah. They all pull up their weapons. And I thought, this is not going to end well. So I, I was trying to calm it down. But right then, their major, my counterpart, pulled up. Mm -hmm. He calmed his guys down. I calmed my guys down. And he I explained what was going on. And he said he'd investigate it. And he did. And he came he came and found me two weeks later in my sector and said, you were absolutely right. Oh, that guy is now in Chechnya. He's gone. Oh, wow. That's cool. And we got a new lieutenant there. You know, he that major and I, he didn't speak English. I didn't speak Russian. Uh -huh. We stayed in contact at once. Once a month, we had lunch together, either in their sector or my sector. Uh -huh. And I preferred my sector because their food was horrible. <laughs> Um, and then, and then even after we left Kosovo for a couple of years, we kept in touch. His wife spoke English. So I would, when I wrote a letter, she would read it to him. Uh -huh. and in the American army, you can always find somebody who speaks Russian. Yeah. So we stayed in contact for a couple of years until he was killed in, in Chechnya. A few years That's sad. And his wife was the one I, I had written a letter and his wife wrote back saying, you know, so, sad. But, but, you know, again, you, you find yourself in situations and you just, you got to figure out a way out of it. You got to, and you can't think about yourself. You got to think about the people you have responsibility that have a privilege to lead because it yeah. is a privilege to be a leader. And you got to think about them and, and what the situation is. And, um, and luckily they're Russian, the Russian, my Russian counterpart had the same mindset I did to calm it down. Let's figure this out. Yeah, that's great. And that, and that's a really good reminder that people are people. And just because we have different ideas, different philosophies, different beliefs, it doesn't mean that we can't get along and figure out something, yeah. figure out a way to at least get through this little thing that we have. Well, and we, and we got to get back to that in this country. Uh, you know, yes, I've said many times, you know, not to get political, but yeah, we, we have we have. At one point, at what point in this country did it get to the point where if I disagree with you, I have to hate you? Yes. That's not the America I grew up in. You know, if I disagree with you, then we talk. We figure mm -hmm. out 
why you believe what you believe, why I believe what I believe. And then let's come to a understanding somewhere in the middle where we yeah. both can win. Uh, we may not get exactly what we want, but 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 that's what compromise is. A compromise that helps everybody. Nobody's ever going to get everything they want. And, you know, I tell one of my family members who uh, we have very different political beliefs, but of course we still love each other and we just discuss things. But this person will talk about how bad people are on the other side, you know, whatever. And I'm like, you know what? They're the same percentage of bad people in the world in every, whether it's military, Absolutely. civilian, police, priests, whatever. And I tell them, so that, every, there's bad people in every profession. Yes. Okay. So that same percentage of people in your movement that you feel so strongly about and that that's fine for you to feel strongly, but you have to understand that they're that same percentage of people who are bad people who are not doing things for the right reason. Yeah. And I think I agree with you, not that we all always got along and all that because we're humans, you know, but the fact that we can't even talk anymore is really sad. It's sad. It's sad. And and it's not this country. For you to have a republic, you have to have debate. Yeah. That's, that's a requirement. And we, we, we're we teaching people not to talk. You know, what's that thing? You, you don't talk about religion. You don't talk about politics. You don't. There's one other one. I can't remember what it is. Yeah. Money. Money. Yeah. Money, religion and politics. Well. We shouldn't be telling people not to talk. We should be teaching them how to talk. About how to talk. That's the thing. Yeah. Because, because we got to get back to them. And and I think, you know, again, that's, I, I think part of that responsibility is leaders and yeah. leaders are, at, are, not, are not doing their job. Yeah. Um, at all levels in every profession. Mm -hmm. And we, we got to get back to it because if we don't, we're in trouble. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, what would you say? So if there's somebody out there, because a lot of my audience are entrepreneurs, small business owners, or they may even their company may be bigger, but it's not like, you know, a huge company. What are some of your top um, tips, advice or yeah. slogans or anything that you want to share with them that might be easy for them to remember and that would make a real impact on their business and their life. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm a huge believer that leadership is about people mm -hmm. and people in trust because nobody's going to follow you if they don't trust you. So yeah. that, that doesn't work. So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm a huge believer in getting to know the people that you have the privilege to lead. Um, and so what I, all the advice I give leaders, especially young leaders, the 580 that I had my hand in, I told every single one of them, but I do it for CEOs and presidents of companies, multi-million dollar companies. I tell them the same thing. Every day, your goal should be every day you leave your office and you go out and find one person in your organization. Just one. If you can do more than that, good for you, but one. And you find out something new about that person, not about work about their personal life. What's their mm -hmm. spouse's name? What's their kid's name? What sports do their kids play? What's their hobbies? What do they like, what they don't like? Two things happen when you do that. Number one, you build trust. Because mm -hmm. for somebody to trust you, they got to know you. Yeah. And the only way you're going to do that, I got, you got to keep the leader-led relationship, but that doesn't mean you can't get to know people and they can't get to know you. And that, so you got to do that. So you build trust, which is vital to leadership. And number two, you learn about that person so that when you are assigning tasks and projects and missions and whatever jobs, whatever it is that you've mm -hmm. given them, you'll be able to figure out which which person is a better fit for what you're asking them to do. Yes. Because right now, what, what I see a lot of times is people don't know who works for them. They don't know anything about the people who work yeah. for them. They give them a, a project that they're not even suited for. They hate it. Mm -hmm. Because the guy sitting right next to him or the, the lady sitting right next to him would love that project. And yeah. if you just had to know people, you'd understand that. That's such a great point. And, you know, uh, because when you don't get to know people, you don't know their strengths and weaknesses. But also the more that you know about their background and where they came from, the more you see like the lens that they filter the world through. Sure. And how that might affect 
how they how they might handle something. And and the other thing that I tell people, some of my clients about themselves is, you know, when they think they're not they're not enough or whatever. And I always tell them there's not one single person in the entire world who has your unique set of talents, experiences, and everything. Your entire life has created this tapestry that, and there's not one like it anywhere yeah. in the world. So there's something that you can do in a way that nobody else can. And so when, when leaders understand that about their people, that should yeah. encourage them to want to learn more. But you're yeah. right. So many, de they don't know their name, much less anything about them. Absolutely. And, and so here's the flip side of that. If, if you figure that out about yourself, then you got to understand everybody who works for you brings those unique things too. Exactly. And, and no, look, we all have egos. Anybody yeah. who tells you they don't have an ego is lying to you. Yeah. Okay? And we want people to have an ego. That's what pushes people to be the best at whatever they do. It's what drives them to be yeah. successful. We want people, especially leaders, to have an ego. But as a leader, especially, you have to know when to put that ego aside yeah. and use those talents, those skills, those abilities that the people who work for you have. Mm -hmm. And some of them may be a weakness you have. Somebody on your team that works for you may have a strength. I, I, I can tell you I've learned just as much from people who work for me as I have from people I've worked for. Yeah. I, I, the two people I always use as an example, my first platoon sergeant, Master Sergeant, or then it was Sergeant First Class Powell or Pinson. And, you know, here I am a 24 year old Lieutenant. I pull up, I'm introduced to my new platoon sergeant who has been in the army for 23 years. Yeah. <laughs> He'd been in the army almost as long as I'd been alive. Why would I not listen to a guy like that? Yeah. And then when my last assignment on active duty, I ran an Army ROTC program at the University of South Alabama in Mobile. And Master Sergeant David Powell was my senior NCO. And I, I say he worked for me. He was probably a better leader than I was. Um, and I learned so much from him. And, yeah. you know, every time I had a problem, I'd say, OK, hey, Master Sergeant Powell, here's, here's the issue. This is what I'm looking at. This is what I think. What, mm -hmm. Give me your point of view. And a lot of times I use his, not mine. Yeah. Well, that's the way you learn. And that's the way you also come up with the best ideas. If you're like in this microcosm and you don't have other ideas coming in, there's no way that you can come up with the best solution. Goes back to what we were talking about, people not communicating and being afraid yeah. to talk to each other. There's well, no way if we're in our silos that we can ever come yeah. up with the ideas that can make all of us the best that we can be. Yeah. Well, if you don't use other people that you have working for you, if you don't use their ideas, their skills, their knowledge, you're only using your own. Yeah. And I don't care how long you've been doing what you're doing. You don't have all of the answers. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. If you think you do, go do something else. Please. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't care how long you've been a leader. And I've been a leader for over 40 years. I still learn things every day. You know, I've, yeah. I've been on 165 podcasts now. And almost every podcast, I pick up something that I add to my my book saying, uh -huh. you know, I can use that somewhere down the road. And, yeah. and if, if when I go and I'm a keynote speaker somewhere, I go to the blood breakout sessions and I got a notebook. I'm writing notes. You uh -huh. know, somebody asked me one day, they said, aren't you the keynote speaker? And I said, yeah, I am. And they said, <laughs> Why are you taking notes? I said, because you might have an answer that I don't know that I've been looking for. Yeah, that's right. And the, yeah, and the more we talk, the more we share, the more we all learn from each other. And when we quit talking, that's when we can never, ever yeah. understand each other. Yeah. So and, tell everybody. And we, don't, and we don't come up with the right answers. Right. And, yeah. Well, and I was going to add on, and I, I know you said this earlier, but I was going to remind people that listening to the people that work for you and acknowledging what people do, make sure that they get the kudos or the whatever you want to yeah. call it, acknowledge it so that they feel appreciated and they feel honored. Um, that's one of the worst feelings is the in the world mm -hmm. is to feel like proud that you've done something and then realize kind that of nobody, like... Either nobody gave you credit for it or somebody took credit for it. Yes, that's it's, worst like, thing. Stealing. it's that's, like stealing. That's the worst thing. I, I always tell young leaders, give credit where credit is due. Yeah. You know... It, acknowledge those people that did a great job. It uh -huh. doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. Yes.
your organization, the one you're in charge of, still accomplished what it was supposed to. Who cares who, who the key players in it were? Doesn't Amen. matter. In Amen. the end, you're, you're responsible, but in the end, they're accountable. So they did a good job. They ought to be uh, given the credit for it. And they make you look good. And when you acknowledge that people who work for you are able to do this great job and do whatever it is that they've done, then that makes you look better to and go take over some other problem to maybe. And, and, it, and it motivates them. Yeah. They think, okay, I, I got kudos for that. To I'll work even harder next time. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, there's that is a win win situation. Yeah. To give credit where credit is due. For sure. Okay. Tell everybody about your book, where they can get it, and where they can learn more about you and maybe book you for speaking or attend one of your speaking events. Yeah. So I, I, I published my book in February, 2020. Um, no, 21, February, 21. And uh, it, if you're looking for leadership theory, don't pick up my book. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't even mention the word theory in my book. I, my book is about everyday things that every leader can do to help improve their leadership skills and abilities and empower the people that they have the privilege to lead so they become better people and better workers, which then makes your organization better. So that's what my book is about. And I talk about about nine or 10 principles in there that major principles with some sub principles in there that have been part of leadership for the last 2000 years and will be for the next 2000 years. Leadership yep. isn't going to change. <laughs> At any, anytime somebody walks up to me and says, I got this new thing about leadership, I said, get away from me. <laughs> yeah. There is nothing new about leadership is about people, and uh -huh. trauma, period. Um, and so if you want to get pick up a copy, then it's on Amazon. It's in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and audible. And I read the audible. The only other voice on there is my wife. And she read the about the author and the forward because she wrote the forward. So I wanted her to read that oh, nice. on the book. And then um, and if you want a signed copy of it, then go to my website and tell to send me an email uh, or give me a call. My cell phone number, my email is on there okay. and we'll figure out how to get you a signed copy of it. Um, if you want me to come talk uh, to your at your next event or to your company, uh, I, I do companies, I do uh, conferences, I do associations, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. never, I try to never turn down a chance to talk to people yeah. uh, about leadership because that is my passion right now. And so just get, contact me one of those ways and we'll figure it out from there. And on that website is also all my social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, and all that. I, okay. I'm mainly on LinkedIn. That's how Lisa and I yeah. do LinkedIn. Okay, so, tell us your website again. But my website is www.ltcoakmccullough.com. Okay. And if you can't remember that, go to LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah, there, aren't, there aren't too many Oakland McCulloughs out there. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for joining me. It was great meeting you last week. And I'm so excited that you were able to join me on the show. I've had a great time talk with you. And now I've got to read the book. Yeah. Well, I, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And this has been great. You know, every time I, I get on a podcast or when I go in person and speak, my goal is always one thing, to have left everybody who's in the audience with at least one thing they can use uh -huh. to help improve their leadership ability. And, you know, for different people to be different things. Yeah. Um, and that's OK. But my goal, I hope that we helped everybody in the audience learn at least one thing they can use to improve their leadership ability. I hope so too. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody in the audience. And I will see y'all next week. See ya.